I know a secret. I do. I know a secret, and I'm curious. Would you like me to share that secret with you? Would you? I was hoping you'd say yes, because the secret involves you. And where did I find this secret? I found it in the Bible. In the New Testament book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 27, the Apostle Paul prefaces the statement by saying, and this is the secret. Right? Right there on the pages of the Bible. Now, It was supposed to be there. <laughs> ah, and this is the secret. There you go. Good. What about that? And this is the secret. Listen, do you want another secret? Link, you got to lean in. If you want another secret, come on now. Come on. You lean in. I'm going to share it. Yes. You ready? Yes. Christ lives in you. See that? Amen. Apostle Paul said, here's the big secret. Christ lives where? In you. I find that to be an amazing thought. Now, it's no secret that Christ lives. Every, every Easter, we set aside a weekend to remind each other and to celebrate the fact that Christ lives. If I, asked, if I had asked this morning, where does he live? I think a lot of people would have answered this. They'd say, uh, he's seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And you know what? You would have been exactly right. Here's the deal, though. Not only is the Father, God, but the Son is also God, which means he has this unique characteristic or attribute called omnipresence, which means he can be everywhere at one time. So he is seated at the right hand of the Father right now, but he also lives inside every believer. That includes you. Christ lives in you. It doesn't mean that he's just available, that he's up there in heaven, and if we call on him, boom, he comes to our rescue. It means he's already here. 24-7, 365 days a year for the remainder of our life. He's right there because he lives in us. Now let's think about this for just a moment. One day, Jesus found himself out in the middle of nowhere. And he was surrounded by thousands of people. 5,000 families, the Bible tells us. I don't know, 15, 20,000 people gathered around. They have a common need. They need food. No problem. Go to the grocery store. Go to the cafe. Oh, remember now, they're in a remote place. There are no restaurants, there are no grocery stores, yet the people have this need. And Jesus says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to meet the need. Does anybody have any food on hand? A little boy comes forward. One boy out of 15 or 20,000 people thought ahead, and he had his lunch. Jesus said, if you don't mind, give that to me. And Jesus took this one lunch, and he multiplied it. Supernaturally now. He stretched that one lunch and began to pass it on to the disciples who passed it on to the people so that in a short period of time 15 to 20,000 people not only got a bite it wasn't like the bread we get at communion you know what I mean they ate till they were full some of them were miserable they couldn't even breathe they ate so much and then in the end, had more left over than this. Had 12 baskets of leftovers after all this had taken place. That same Jesus lives in you. I want you to think about that. What that means to you. That same Jesus. There was another time where Jesus found himself in a wilderness. The Holy Spirit led him out in the wilderness where he was going to be tempted by the devil for 40 grueling days and nights. And the devil tempted Jesus, and Jesus said, nope, resisted. So the devil, you know how the devil does. If you resist one temptation, he just gives up, runs off, and like, okay, I lost. No, you know that's not how he works, is it? So he gave him temptation number two. Jesus went, no deal. 
So I believe the enemy stepped back and went, this is going to be more difficult than I thought. I better make this temptation more lucrative, more attractive. So he pulled out all stops, Scott. He said, he took Jesus to a place where he could see all the kingdoms of the world. He said, you see all that? I give it all to you. All the wealth, all the glory, all the power, I give it all to you. You'll be the king. And you'll bypass that old ugly cross and the suffering and the beating and the death. You can bypass all that and be the king. All you got to do is bow down and worship me. I'll actually be the number one guy. You'll be the number two guy. But Jesus said, are you kidding me? That's a hard translation, by the way. Are you kidding me? Uh, the answer to that is no. No way. And furthermore, I'm tired of this game. I'm done with all this. You need to get. And you know what the enemy did? He fled. He ran. Do you understand? That's the same Jesus that lives right inside of you. And one night Jesus got into a boat with his buddies. They're going to sail across the Sea of Galilee. Jesus lay down in the back of the boat and went to sleep. Somewhere out in the middle of the sea, a, a fierce storm descended upon them. I mean, it was nasty. Gale force winds, towering waves. The boat took on water. These men, I believe, frantically, desperately tried to row themselves to shore with no success. And they realized something. We're going to drown right here. This is, this is, this is where a story's going to end. And finally, one of them had the wherewithal to say, why don't we wake Jesus up? Now, they woke him up, and uh, they had kind of an attitude you know, like, uh, if you really cared about us, I think you could have uh, got involved here sooner. Why don't you do something? So Jesus stood up, looked up into the sky, and spoke to the wind. And he said, that's enough of that. Hush. It's time for you to be quiet. You know what happened? You know what happened? Wind quit blowing. And that's kind of amazing. And then Jesus turned and he looked at the ocean, or he looked at the sea, and he said, and, and you, it's time to stop all the commotion. Whew. Smooth as glass. Where this great storm had been, now there was a great calm. Do you know, understand that that's the same Jesus that lives right inside of you? By morning, these guys, they, when they finished, they sailed across the sea. They came to the land called the Gerasenes, and they were met with a really odd individual there. Uh, there was a man who came running up to them, and he was, let's see, how would I say this, uh, buck naked. He, ran, he was buck naked. He comes running up to Jesus. Let me give you his backstory. There was a time when he was as normal as anybody else, and something happened. Something took over his mind, began to change the way he thought and then began to change the way he behaved himself and so that he be his behavior became erratic and even self-destructive uh, he couldn't keep his clothes on I mean it was a, it was really embarrassing to his wife when they go to dinner parties and things and he came out of the restaurant like sorry this is Bob Bob's got a little issue right now we're gonna have we're working through it and but it got they he tried to change himself he could not others tried to change him they could not so the next thing you know he moves up into the tombs he lives in the cemetery, and he howls like an animal at night. Well, this is the dude that came running up to Jesus. And immediately, Jesus begins to have a dialogue, not with the man. You go, what? No. Jesus recognized his problem. He recognized what had taken over his thinking and his behavior and his life. This man was inhabited by evil spirits. And so Jesus didn't talk to the man. He talked to the spirits. And, and you know what he told him? You're going to have to get out of this guy. Today, you're vacating the premises. These demons began to negotiate. They're like, well, you know, and they knew that we got to go. They knew that because Jesus is not only Lord over the angels. He's Lord over everything. So he said, there's a big herd of pigs over here. You know, don't just send us off into oblivion. Let us go inhabit the pigs. And Jesus conceded and said, that's fine, but get. And so uh, thousands of demons go, and they invade the pigs. And, you know, I usually make a joke or two about such a, a loss of 
barbecue and bacon, it always brings a tear to my eyes. I'm not going to do that. I want to, I want to point, what, when these demons fled the man, what impact to have on him? The Bible said the next time you saw him, he was fully dressed and in his right mind. He had his life back. His sanity, his life back. He had been delivered. Do you understand? That's the same Jesus that is living right inside of you. One more. There was a day, there was this lady. She had been really sick for 12 years. She had been to every doctor, every specialist. I mean, she, you know, it didn't, I mean, to all of them. They had tried every treatment they could think of, every prescription, and her situation only got worse. And in the course of this, she spent every nickel she had. So she was in a hopeless situation. This frail, weak woman heard about Jesus and found out where he was at. And she believed with all her heart, if I can get to him, he can heal me. Matter of fact, she believed this. He don't even have to touch me. He don't have to say anything. You know, if I can just get to him, he can heal me. So she traveled. She found this group, this, this, this weak, sick woman worked her way through that crowd and got to Jesus. And I believe she was so timid, she didn't say, hey, me, you know, I need a little help here. Or, you know, can, can you wave your hands over me? You know what she did? She got close enough. She could touch the hem of his robe. And this is what she believed. If I can just do that, I believe he'll heal me. And the Bible said she touched the hem of his robe and healing power shot through him, shot through her body, and instantly she was completely healed. Jesus did in an instant what an entire medical community couldn't do in 12 years. You know that's the same Jesus that lives right inside of you. The Jesus that died on a Friday and rose again on a Sunday. The Jesus that laid his life down on a Friday and took it back on a Sunday. The Jesus that in doing so overcame death, hell, the grave, and the devil. Lives right inside of each of you. Do you understand what that means? You never have a need that can be met. You'll never face a temptation you cannot resist. You will never encounter a storm that can't be calmed. You will never be possessed by something you can't be delivered from. You will never encounter a sickness that, he, that can't be cured. That he can't cure. You'll never face an enemy you can't vanquish. You'll never find yourself in a battle you can't win. You say, why? Because Christ lives in you. I'm trying to make a point here, and that is this. You need to walk out here understanding you're not alone. You will never face anything in this life alone because Christ lives in you. And all of his resources are available to you in whatever it is you're facing at the moment. With that in mind, I want to encourage you to do something. I want to encourage you to change the way you think. I want you to go from uh, an uh, I can do nothing way of thinking to I can do everything thinking. You know, I need an explanation here, okay? Some of you think, what Jesus said in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. That is exactly right. But I also believe Paul said, here's the secret. Christ lives in you. Therefore, you and Christ are not apart. You're together. Right? Now, when the Apostle Paul got a hold of the fact that Christ lives in me, it changed the way he thought, and he developed an I can do everything mentality. Uh, he even wrote about it, Philippians chapter 4, verse number 13. And then here it comes, man, bam, for I can do what did Paul say? Everything through Christ who gives me strength. I can face anything. 
I can, I can accomplish anything, not in my own ability, my wisdom, my power, my education, anything, my support system, but I'll tell you what, through his strength, because he's in there, and I have access to him, and he's going to help me, I can do everything. Is that big? Here's, here's what I want. I'm going to call it holy optimism. When you realize that Christ lives in you, Rather than always anticipating defeat. This is not going to work out. This is not good. I want you to start expecting victory. Why? Christ lives in you. I want you to expect the need to be met. I want you to expect that you have the willpower, the strength to say no to the temptation. I want you to expect the storm to calm. I want you to expect deliverance from whatever it is that has power over you. I want you to expect healing from the sickness. I want you to expect victory over your enemy. And it's no longer you're going to uh, just assume defeat. You're going to expect victory because in Romans chapter 8, verse 37, this is what Paul said. We will be given overwhelming victory through Christ. Did you hear me? This is in the Bible, y'all. This, I'm not up here to, with a feel-good sermon trying to make you feel better about things. I'm telling you this, come off the page, but this is what Paul said. Paul said, we can expect overwhelming victory through Christ. There's a word, we're jumping, I can't jump it. He didn't just say, we're going to be expecting victory. He said, we're going to be expecting what kind of victory? Overwhelming, overwhelming victory through Christ, because he lives in us, and he helps us, and, he has, and, and we have access to his resources. Let me tell you what, no more of this, oh, I can do nothing. I can do everything through the Christ that lives in me and the strength he brings into my life, the resources he brings into my situation. This is going to work out. As victory. I, I guess if I could sum up my sermon, it'd be just like this. I, I got to sum it for somebody here. This is what I was sent to say, and you, you hear me. You win. You got it? I know how this chapter of your life ends. I know, and was sent here to tell you, you win. You got it? You are going to win. Overwhelming victory is already yours because Christ lives in you. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord, what an awesome, awesome thing. I mean, it just, it's mind-blowing. The more we learn about what you do for us, what you've done for us, God, it's humbling. And it just, it just, we're just so appreciative, God. And, uh, but here's what we got to do. I want us to walk out of here today with a different mindset. No more of this, I can do nothing. I can do nothing. God, through the strength of Christ who lives in us, we can do everything. So I pray that we're looking, God, for the win. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.